Hello, I'm Aaron Williams, creator of Nodwick and Full Frontal Nerdity, and you're listening to Roll for Initiative, the only first edition AD&D gaming podcast. D20 Radio, your gamers roll. www.d20radio.com Roll for initiative. Hello, folks, and welcome to the Roll for Initiative podcast, issue number 30. That's right, we've turned 30 issues, finally at the big 3-0. I'm one of your hosts, DM Vincent, and in this corner, weighing in at 175, six foot one, DM Jason! Yay! So yeah, I'm a little taller than that, but you are actually pretty close. <laughs> and in the opposing corner, the challenger tonight. Unknown, unknown, and unknown, DM Nick. <laughs> Ugh, I'm gonna take you down. I'm gonna roll a crit on you. <laughs> That's right. <Hi. laughs> and special guest tonight, the Mad Irishman himself, Patrick Murphy. Patrick, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Wonderful. Very, very well. If anyone's not familiar, uh, Patrick does his own website with various character sheets for various old school games, new school games, and any school game you can think of. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Yes. So let's get ready to roll some dice. Anyway, that was kind of bad. So, <laughs> uh, first thing on the agenda tonight, uh, let's talk about our Skype games. Jason, let me let's go with yours first because I'm dying to hear about your Skype game. Oh, geez, yeah. Mm. So uh, yeah, I wanted to give a little uh, hello to all of the people that have joined the game. So, uh, and the, the Skype game is pretty big. We've got Gray Wolf, Carl, Buzz, Vince, John, and Rich me? all playing, and it's a testament to how good. Uh, they are as players into how well Skype handles um, or, you know, just online gaming can really work that this uh, seven-person gaming group, including the DM, is going so smoothly. Uh, but the uh, I've got two different groups actually going through this uh, campaign that I'm creating as it goes along. And we're starting, of course, in the village of Hogsend. And uh, the other group that's playing is here in New York. Uh, it includes my old friend Andrew and uh, three new friends, Robert, Brian, and David, and nobody named Dennis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which my players will understand. I don't know. We had a ghost named Dennis that showed up on our mailing list, and I kept wondering why Dennis wasn't showing up to the games. Turns out there's mm. no Dennis. But uh, it's, it's going really good. They are all... Uh, I'll tell you, the guys who are playing in person, they managed to, in one session get all the way to the second level of the dungeon where the Skype guys had taken three weeks to get there. Well, three sessions. So it's interesting because the, the, I've set, I set up this huge sort of uh, area of diversions and, and monsters and things for people to fall into and have trouble with before they finally got to figuring out how to get down to the second level. And uh, the group that's here in New York, they just – went shoom, straight to it. They they outsmarted their DM. It was wonderful. Wow. Cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. How's yours going? Oh, excellent. We just uh, finished up uh, the second session with actually almost the full entire group. Uh, first session was only two players, and uh, the, he, the, the magic user in the group wanted to get his uh, spells, and I was just like, you know what? This is an excellent opportunity to role play and get him back into the game because he hasn't played in probably... He said 15, 20 years. So I figured him and another person, Chuck, so Chuck and Jack, the two of them came on Skype with me. We did a prelude. We uh, got his spells and his spell book and then sunk the hooker in for the whole campaign. I hope you meant you sunk the hook in. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And uh, <laughs> Help put the hooker in. No, no, no. no You're no. playing mm-hmm. a totally different role-playing. <laughs> yeah, that's different role-playing in itself. And... Uh, <laughs> Second episode involved four characters where he picked up a dwarven fighter and an elven thief. And uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of spookiness going on. Uh, people who have listened to it and enjoyed the, the dwarf who is uh, kind of getting picked on in the episode, but he had a lot of fun with the zombie horse and the voices laughing and speaking at him, making him go insane. So nice. Yeah, you've got a lot more <laughs> demi-humans uh, than, than we have in our groups. Really? It's interesting. Yeah, in each of our groups, we only have one. There's a half elf in one group and a uh, 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 gnome in the other. That's it. Yeah, this upcoming Thursday, there's supposed to be 
two more players joining. Uh, I got to figure out how to bring them in too. So. <laughs> oh, you mean how to like work in what's happening with them? Yeah, because they they are weren't with the party, so I got to figure right. out how to get them into the party. So. Oh yeah, yeah in that's my always case, a toughie. I, yeah. It is in my case. We had uh, our first complete kill uh, in the Skype group, mm. and so I wanted GPK? to. GPK. No, no, not no, no, no. The first complete kill of a single player. I mean, we oh, had two. Okay. We had two kills, but the first kill was just put in a coma and revived. Uh, uh, you know, minus three hit points and all that. The other one was, uh, well, he he. I can say this now that it's happened. He got killed by some camp fault. I don't know if you know the camp fault, mm. but it's a it's it's a it's a treacherous monster that looks just like some tree roots. Oh and, yeah, that's a uh, monster manual too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he got killed by that. There was no way to bring him back. So, what I did was got I killed by a tree. Yeah, oh, the best part, it was the druid. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. oh, irony. <laughs> oh, man. Yes, thy name is DM. Uh, <laughs> but but we, brought in, we brought in the new character because it just so happened that in this particular set of catacombs, I had a set of what looked like statues but are in fact, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, tra- what's the thing? You're in, in stasis. Temporal stasis. Frozen. And so I just swapped out one of the temporal stasis statues for his new character and had uh, this character who had been imprisoned there a couple years ago and they managed to release him and now he's in the party. Woo! So. Nice. Uh, you can listen to all this. Uh, well, Jason should be up shortly. He's having it edited uh, for content purposes. So, But yeah, to just split it up. Cut, cut it into fourths or whatever. I mean, I think yours sounds a lot more um, entertaining you know, we just sort of oh. played the game and recorded it. Yeah, I, I was kind of designing mine for the players and for someone actually sitting along listening for entertainment. So I tried to do both, cater to both people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our, you ours go- is really, you know, if you listen to ours, you'll basically hear just a bunch of people playing. We, we don't have the sensor filter on, so you will hear swear words. Um, but uh, it's not going to be as... as uh, oriented for listeners necessarily, but you'll still listen and like it. It's still good. It's still a, a good idea of how a DM style works. Cool. Yeah, that's the big thing is you'll hear the difference between our two different DM styles. Yes, Jane, uh, Jason's uh, by the book, stick his nose in there, and my just, eh, roll dice. <laughs> yep. Well, you'll hear it. Mine goes just fast. It goes just as fast. It's just uh, a little bit more of a grognardy kind of way of hitting some of the I'm rules. Somewhere <laughs> in between, I think. I don't know. Nick yeah, is... we got to get you running a game. Yeah, Nick. Well, yeah, I, well, I uh, yesterday, uh, Saturday, I was in a game. We had kind of a get. We had a guest uh, DM. He's he's uh, up from uh, uh, Alabama. He's I knew mm-hmm. from uh, a few years ago. Met him at uh, he was either Origins or Gen Con. His name's Nate. If he's listening, hey Nate. And um, one of the games that he ran, it was just two years ago, he ran it at Origins, and everybody had a blast at, was his adventure called Nightmare at Frandor's Keep, which <laughs> nice. is... I, yeah. Yeah. It's a, if you're familiar with the Hackmaster version of Keep of the Borderlands... No. Um, it, it's, it's like, it's that, but he's... But imagine 28 Days Later, the movie... With that the, sounds awesome. Yeah, Lance. that does. It was tough. Oh my gosh! Yeah, fast zombies coming from everywhere. <laughs> There's nice. like, and he had special rules for overbearing. We had we had a uh, one person take it down rather quickly. One bite near is just t- totally thrown down to the ground. But uh, we got a li- we actually get in past the courtyard. <laughs> it was that tough. Nice. It was really, really fun. Just trying to take. Uh, I'm glad we had a magic user along. I mean, mm. thank goodness for fireballs. Oh my gosh! <laughs> How about a priest? You should... <laughs> oh yeah, we had two clerics. All I right. was playing one of them. We had two ninth level clerics, and unfortunately, these type of undead that he made, you can't turn them. Oh, um, they're not okay. affected by anything like protection from evil or anything like that because they're a. Virus Genetic, yeah. Yeah, they're a virus made yeah. zombie. Well, if they're like the twenty eight days later movie, then it's definitely uh not a real zombie, so 
Yeah, because one of the characters... It's not a was... real zombie. No, it's not a real zombie, Jason, okay? <laughs> you know, yeah, they're, not, they're not real, genuine zombies like you feel find in real life. They're not George A. Romero zombies, okay, pal? <laughs> no, they're, they're not. not. the ones that just, like, are slow and shuffling. These ones will chase your keister down and, you know, have your butt for a sandwich. I but, actually uh, saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, Zombies don't run. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, I wish they didn't. Yeah. Because no. we had one character... He, the, it was the magic user. He was taken down by 400 zombie pixie fairies. <laughs> yeah. What? Was pretty, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, I actually, so, I, there's a, a, a monster I want to write up for AD&D because some friends of mine who are from China are really into these old 1970s Chinese vampire movies. Have you ever seen yeah. them? Mm-hmm. You know, the ones where they stick their arms out and they hop? Yeah, yeah. I'd never heard of them before, so I want to make the, I want to make those. The, I think they're called Jiang Shi. I want to make those uh, Chinese vampires. They're sort they're sort of half zombie, half vampire, and they hop. Oh out. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you want to listen to the podcast, you can go to www.rfiactualplay.tk, and you can listen to the podcast. Uh, there's two up for mine. Jason's will be up soon, and. Uh, that's that. Nick, better start a game. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, Nick. Mm-hmm. All right. If I'm I got sure we got time. some listeners that would be uh, up for it. <laughs> yes. If I have time. The Nick- I have Actually, the I, I, I met life. a guy on the street <laughs> the other day who would probably want to join. Yeah. I was walking down the street wearing a Dungeons & Dragons t-shirt, like the one that looks like the Mountain Dew logo. Yeah. And okay. I heard this, this voice behind me. He's like, Dungeons & Dragons? Is that the tabletop or the video game? I was like, ah, ah, who's talking to me? What, what? And I turn around. <laughs> Get the voices and, out of my head, ah. Right. Oh. <laughs> and I turn around, and it's like, you know, I'm just out on a New York street, tons of people out. And I'm looking kind of down, really, to see who would be saying it. And I end up looking up about four inches into, like, this huge dude's face. And he's just this big dude. And I was like, oh, no, what? And then he starts telling me. You know, I used to play a magic user back in the 80s when I was in the army. Oh, no. He started with a character story. Run! <laughs> that was awesome. It was, it was such a great, like, sidewalk moment. You know, cool. this guy who, like, you look at him, he's this big dude that, you know, army dude and all this kind of stuff. Never would have uh, pegged him off the bat. And he just starts telling me about this. And so, you know, maybe he's listening right now. I didn't write his name down, but it was something. If he's listening right now, I probably shouldn't get his name wrong, but it started with an M. Uh, it was like Maliki or something, but anyways, oh. it was really, really cool guy. So that was just kind of a neat thing. That's if you want to cool. know where, if you want to know where Jason lives, email <laughs> rfi staff at gmail dot com to beat him up anytime soon. Yeah. Uh. No, uh, <laughs> because Nick, didn't you start playing in the service? Or no, no. Actually, no, or, no. But I did have a pretty good gaming group. I was in San Diego. It was a really yeah. good time there. Yeah, yeah I heard there's a lot of good gaming groups over there. Hmm. Jason, yeah. articles. Yep. Uh, didn't Todd right, put so, up a new one? Yeah, we got a new one for this week. We always have a new one for this week. Todd Hughes oh, yeah. is really uh, you know, delivering some great stuff. I mean, people over at the Dragon's Foot Forums know him for the things that he's written over oh, there. Yeah. And, Todd is the know, man. Yeah, we're really lucky to have him writing good things for us, too. Awesome. So uh, this week, it's called More Human Than Human. Well, and Rob Zombie's now that here? Got, yep. Oh, <laughs> now okay. that I've got <laughs> White Zombie stuck in your head. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, if Matt was... Uh, able to put in some of that without violating copyright anyways matt put in like 5.5 5 seconds that way we don't ruin any copyright yeah i think 5.5 <laughs> 5 seconds <laughs> hey it's under six all right yeah well anyway so this uh yeah this week it's all about making the human a more attractive class in ad and d and he has some ideas for ways of doing that uh i won't go into all the specifics here but you know, it's, it's it's a cool house rule kind of way to do things, and uh, you know, worth a read. Awesome. And yeah, did he? Is, cool it, stuff in there. is his contest still going on? Uh, I believe it is. Yeah. So anybody who wants to design a monster for the module that he is writing uh, can write to us or write to his email address, which we'll put in the show notes. And uh, you know, he wants a, to. It's right in his article too. Yep. Yep. He has a few things around it. Like I, I believe he doesn't want. Uh, any undead, right, 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 and uh, he needs it to be somebody, something you can live underground and for the right levels. But you can find all the details on the site. Right, definitely want to encourage people to go and read the article and comment and do lots of other fun things. Uh, so forums that should be up 
shortly. Where I know we promised last time we should be up by now, but we just had a little technical snafu, but we fixed it. Yeah, we're we're those snafu snafu rhymes into shape. with yeah, it starts with a J and it rhymes with Asen. Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> but I yeah, wasn't I'm getting those up. I wasn't going to say that, but you know. <laughs> And yeah, uh, I'm trying to set them up so when you go to any article, you'll be able to, rather than just commenting on the article and have your comments kind of trapped in that one place, that we can actually tie the forums to the articles so you can have a richer... Hey, work those kobolds harder. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, no, yeah, sure, <laughs> no problem. And uh, guess what, guys? We got a voicemail. All right. Sweet. This voicemail... Those. I'm, I'm just going to play for you, and then we'll talk about it a second. So here we go. This is Lass, and I, Data Grognard, who listens to the RFI podcast. So I suppose I have to as well. Thank you. Love the show, guys. Okay. And, uh, Can you provide a translation? Uh, <laughs> that was Lass from the D20 Radio Forums. Uh, she uh, said that she listens to the RFI podcast, and she's a Grognard. Oh, cool. Well, hello, Lass. Yeah, we've seen her around on the uh, Facebook page and on the D20 forums. So that's- oh, yeah, right, off uh, Facebook now. Yeah. yeah, she's always got good things to say, so mm-hmm. nice to hear her voice. Definitely. Uh, she left that today, and she's, she calls herself Last the Nomad. She's been all over the place. She said Ireland, the UK, now she's in New York, so. Oh, well, then she's local for me. Yeah, maybe she cool. can... Uh, yeah, put her put her in our game. Yeah, go into your you game. Go. There you go, Perfect. Jason. Anyway, right. um, so that's going to... End the intro unless we have anything else, and we're heading to Sage Advice. Sage Advice. So, Sage Advice. Nick, you want to say it again? <laughs> sage Advice. <laughs> you know, Nick, we do have bumpers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Rubber baby buggy bumpers? Oh. Exactly. Anyway, let's get right into the nitty gritty here. Uh, Actually, the first email we had come in wasn't an email. It was from the D20 Radio Forums, and uh, it is from Lass. It's actually a really cool, interesting question, so uh, you guys listen up. I was playing a fighter who had a person, on her, and on her person, a regular sword and a negative one cursed sword. We came across an encounter <laughs> with a werewolf. As such, you need a plus one weapon to affect it. So I tried out the negative one weapon with the argument that since it's still magically imbued, that should be... It should be able to affect a magical creature. Loud debate, page flipping ensued before the GM conceded my point and gave me the roll to hit with negative one modifier. Do you think this was a correct ruling, or was this a pouty face, sad eyed girl effect on the GM <laughs> that gave me the ruling? I absolutely a- correct. Absolutely. I vote absolutely correct. It was a good ruling. Great ruling. I don't know about yeah. that. I, I would have done the same way. I think I would have too, because it is a magically imbued. Weapon, I guess. Yeah, so. it, 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 it has they, a negative say, effect, but hey. When they say you requires a magic uh, weapon to hit, it doesn't say a magic weapon with a plus to hit. There's magic weapons out there that have no pluses at all, and they and they still count. Yeah, but a werewolf, you need a plus one, one weapon better. or better oh. to affect it. A negative one is a negative one weapon. Oh, you know what? I didn't. You know what? You're right. I was just thinking. You, needs a magical weapon to hit. She, needs a plus one. Her, her, her argument pretty much was, well, it's still magical and it's negative one. Why not allow me to hit with a magically negative one weapon? Is pretty much her argument. You know what? You know this what? is one of those things where you're like, the rules say one thing, and still it's like, wow, that's a cool idea. Maybe I'll just let the player pull this off. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good bit of letting the player pull it off. But now that you put it that way, I didn't listen carefully enough it's actually yeah. I, I, I wouldn't yeah, I mean do it usually because... it says plus one or better yeah. not just magical weapons so yeah and ah. that's my spe- and my specific argument a minute ago which was that hey there's some things with no pluses and they're still magic same thing here if you pulled out a, pl- a magical sword that had no actual pluses mm-hmm. then it wouldn't work either right mm-hmm. right so, so it's basically the it is the pouty face. Yeah, the pouty face <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that always works. Yeah, that always works. Apparently, uh, well, that's all right. Yeah, Jason, next letter. All right. So uh, Peter B writes in and comments about clerics and their weapons, and he says here, "I'm siding with Jason on this." <laughs> now this time it's not like I did last week where I played you <laughs> by not telling you the rest of the sentence. He really does side me on this. 
um, I think we shouldn't confuse a god's worshippers with their priesthood. For example, the closest that Norse traditions had to a priesthood were unarmed seeresses called Volva, whose name literally meant wand carrier or carrier of a magic staff. They didn't carry magic weapons, but participated in battle in symbolic means using their wands or weaving looms, which means, historically speaking, clerics of Odin and Thor did not carry spears or hammers, although their worshippers certainly did. In short, having the ability to speak with unimaginably the potent divine <laughs> beings who grant them powers, clerics may be understandably less interested in conventional weapons. I think that the right way to distinguish between the gods that clerics worship is by the powers that they grant. Cool. That was very... It's a good point. Yeah, a good take on it. Insightful. Um, yeah, I disagree. Well, I mean, it, it's, a good, it's a good take on it. Ultimately, my response to all of these is the rules say no edged weapons. So you can spend all day talking about why that rule is where it is, but if you want to play by the book, it's no edged weapons. Yeah, sorry, Nick. I'm going to have to side with Jason on that one. I know you're, 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 you're different with that, but, you know. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, stick, up, I'll stick up for you, Nick. I kind of like, okay. still like the idea that Disconnect Patrick? Particular no. <laughs> to, hey, hey. <laughs> no, they're not wrong. That's the thing, is that Patrick and Nick are not wrong. They're just There's not nothing doing wrong it right. with playing it that way in your game. It's, it's just your game. different. Yeah, it's, it's just different. Yeah, it's no, I, I definitely think both sides have excellent arguments for this. I think it. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, though, it just comes down to, um, you know, your style of play and do you want to be um, are you more worried about balance? Are you more worried about you know preserving that old school feel and that you know you've got to have a mace if you're a cleric, or you know are you really obsessed with kind of like customizing and stripping down a religion and that kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. You know, there's there's nothing that says you have to play by the book. Um, I was reading an article this morning. Uh, I was trying to find in the old Dragon magazines where they first started introducing AD and D as a concept. And somewhere around Dragon number 11 or 12, uh, like late 70s, Gary Gygax wrote an article explaining you know, what the relationship was and all of the different things that were going on with D&D. And he said, look, we've got this guy, you know, Moldave, who's going to write some stuff for us, so I think he'll do a good job and all that kind of stuff. And it just reminded me of just how loose and open and developing the rules always were. So there's nothing... Right. There's nothing that says that because you're playing a cleric the way that you feel makes more sense means you're not playing old school. You're probably playing more old school because you're making up your rules. Yeah, true. You're just, you know, but if you wanted to say, listen, we're playing by the book, you know, something you could have done at an RPGA tournament back in the day, that's a different story. Okay. Uh, I'm with you on that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just another way of doing it. So that's how I look at it as well. Okay. Uh, last letter, Nick, yours. Yeah, we got a letter here from Scott O. And he's a new listener from England. So hello from there across the pond. I stumbled across your podcast by accident on iTunes, and I'm now totally hooked. I began playing D&D and AD&D in the early 80s uh, at junior school with friends and now getting back into the original games I played as a kid at the age of 37. Also, as a kid... And this one gets really cool. I think a lot of us can relate to this. I was a great fan of the Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston fighting fantasy solo adventuring game books. Other books of this sort were the Lone Wolf Adventure books by Joe Deaver. Uh, of course, there was the TSR Endless Quest solo adventure books that were done in the 80s. So I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about these books and any other solo game slash modules connection connected with D and D and AD and D. Do you have any further recommendations of these kinds of books or games? And can I track them down and play? So, what I was able to do is yes, you can find the Steve Jackson Fighting Fantasy Game Books still. There is a website for them for fightingfantasygamebooks dot com and. Uh, you can still find them on Amazon.com. And I remember these. I remember a lot of them. How about you, Vince? Do you remember those uh, Endless Quest books and stuff like 
that back in the day? No, actually, I didn't. I, I've never like I, I was never a module person, or I never used any of those books, so I don't really remember them. At yeah, all. they're they're storybooks that you read, but it was, was it like, like uh, choose your own adventure type things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Then Pick yeah, your I did own play those. Type games. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, books. then I did play those. All right, cool. I know there was. No, a, yeah. Th- it was. I'm sorry, Jason. One second. I just yeah. had a thought really quick. I know there was a whole bunch of modules for uh, OD and D that were solo campaign adventures that you had to roll dice and follow the path. Is that what he's talking about as well? Or, um, yeah, he's. But I think he's talking more about the actual little uh, uh, pocket books of like the endless quest ones and the fighting fantasy solo oh. uh, adventure books that they okay. had by. Uh, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone. Oh, all right. uh, okay. because I remember TSR had those endless quest ones, mm. and those were pretty cool. I remember, uh, I remember those quite fondly from my youth. <laughs> so, Jason, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I actually was trying to to dig up the thing that I was going to talk about, which I'm not digging up very successfully. It was something that I saw on eBay earlier today, and it was a like one of those sort of uh, uh, more choose your own adventure like type of things, and it was put out by TSR, and it was actually, but it was actually a comic. Oh, really? Oh, wow. And oh. do you know what I'm talking about? Because I don't. I don't remember the comic book ones. All I remember were they had the ones by TSR, the Endless Quest ones, and they had the Super Endless Quest ones, which were actually the books. But they actually had a game mechanic that went along with them. Uh, maybe that's what I was seeing. And then those were kind of in competition with the fighting fantasy books by Steve Jackson. Okay. Because those were the ones that were, they were like solo modules. They had a game mechanic and everything with them. Well, maybe but, somebody uh, who's listening can talk, call in and, or write in and tell us other things we're thinking of like that, because that's pretty interesting. Yeah, they're very cool books, and you can still get them, the, the, the Fighting Fantasy ones, on, on Amazon.com. And uh, so if, if our, our new listener is listening, you can definitely still find those. But as far as the TSR ones, they stopped producing them in the mid-'90s, mm-hmm. but I'm sure you could find them on eBay. So, yeah, they're very, very cool. I, I remembered collecting all of those, and I wish I still had them. Because I know my kids would just go gaga for them. Cool. Do you guys remember those uh, crazy modules that TSR had with the invisible ink? So, oh, yes. yeah. I have Blizzard Pass, I have one of those. Yeah. Yeah, yes. what was it? Maze of the Riddling Minotaur or something Maze like that? Maze of the Riddling Minotaur, yes. Wow, crazy. Yeah, and then they had one for AD and D. It was uh, instead of using the uh, marker, it used the little jewel. Um, uh-huh. It used the little gr- red screen, the little uh-huh. uh, piece of red uh, uh, cellophane. Uh, I forget. Uh, Midnight at Dagger Alley. That's what it was called. Uh, yeah, I remember yes, that one. Yes, I do. I had that. I had that one. I don't know what happened to it. You know, there's this this uh, we're going to talk about them in a future episode. But there's these guys, the Game Crafter, who do the on-demand uh, game printing. They'll make box sets and screens and everything. Oh, yeah. I'm going to check with them and see if they have the ability to do things like magic ink, you know, the or whatever you call it, mm-hmm. because it would be because you know that's the thing is if you get one of those old uh, invisible ink modules, you're not going to want to do that. But it would be great to be able to make new versions. Oh, the urge mm. is there to do it, though. It's like, oh, I got to do this. So you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll find out if if the game crafter can do that or not. We'll have to ask yeah. them. All right. So uh, questions, comments, or if I staff at gmail dot com, contact us on Skype. Uh, you can contact me, Alucard D twenty, or just go to the site, click on the link, and uh, drop us a voicemail. So that'll end Sage Advice, and we'll head right into uh, the guest spotlight for tonight. Okay, so welcome to the guest spotlight, and we have our guest this week. Most people know him as the Mad Irishman. In fact, you can go to mad-irishman.net and see all about the things that he's made. Uh, We want to introduce for you today Patrick Murphy. Hello, everybody. (laughs) Hi, Patrick. Hey, Patrick. Yeah, so we just heard your voice a little bit uh, earlier on. But uh, let's take a minute to introduce you to everyone. And uh, for people who aren't familiar, um, 
the main reason that, at least that we first uh, saw the Mad Irishman, was for the amazing reproductions of the uh, what is it? TSR ninety twenty eight Goldenrod player character sheets. Yes. Mm-hmm. In fact, an improvement on the originals. Ones that not only had all the original stuff, but I have some printouts of them here, and that actually allow you to um, add in things like Unearth Arcana classes. Um, and they're in a layered PDF, so you can quickly turn things on or off. Uh, some amazing stuff. Patrick, do you want to tell us, just uh, by way of introduction, uh, some of the other things that you offer as well on the Mad Irishman site? Sure. Um, um, you know, character sheets, obviously, um, in great abundance, not only, like you said, for old school games, but uh, some of the newer ones, uh, you know, God forbid I've even done D&D 4.0. Mm. Uh, but um, <laughs> I've also um, got maps, um, uh, maybe some, uh, I think there's at least one adventure um, up there. And uh, I also uh, dabble in uh, making fonts, uh, mostly to support making character sheets. But um, um, anyway, you can find all of those things link- linked off my site. So you're saying making fonts. You mean – now, I, it's been a long time for me since I've done anything like that. It was Fontographer back when I was doing it. What's the tools now? Uh, actually, Fontographer is back uh, oh. just very recently. So there's a company called uh, Font Lab, um, mm-hmm. and they make a, uh, a software package called Font Lab. And they also have uh, several other tools, but they acquired – uh, the rights to Fontographer, and they recently just uh, updated a little bit, so you can actually do all the kind of um, hardcore things with uh, open type fonts and, and those kind of things, which are you know in most uh, modern operating systems. So, uh, so you should be yeah, you should be right at home. You should be able to oh. fall right back into that. Well, I mean, we'll probably get into a couple things that are a little bit geeky for some people, but I'm really eager to ask you about mm. this because we have some of our own projects where. Yeah. Um, We've been going back and looking at those. But before we do, let's just kind of uh, give a little bit more of an overview of some of the things that are uh, available for people to get. They can go and they can pull down the PDFs, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and now are, I actually, to be honest, I haven't gone through the other sheets. Do you, do, do you always do them with the layers and allowing people to kind of modify the things that are going on inside of them? Well, yeah, it depends a lot um, on when the sheet was made. And uh, to some extent, when I was playing the game, uh, right. so um, I, I couldn't believe it. I went back and looked at uh, my site, and the site's actually been up for twelve years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow! So uh, yeah, back in I think July was a twelve-year anniversary. Happy um, birthday! So, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. And um, you know, um, in a lot of ways, it kind of follows the history of me making character sheets and. Um, uh, there are old ones that uh, I was making before, it, it, you know, ones that I'll never see again because they were on floppies. Uh, you know, I was yeah. making with my Atari 1200XL, <laughs> um, you know, back in the 80s or, or, or whatever. Well, did but, you lose the floppies? Uh, actually, I have the floppies for the Atari. Um, we so can I'm, rebuild it. I'm we hoping can... that those are, those could be reproduced. Mm. What I'm kicking myself is I actually have... Um, a scan of the first D and D character sheet uh, that I made on my Mac SE back in uh, probably 1988, and wow. uh, you know it's bit mapped. So I you know like dot by dot drawn out. I think in Mac Paint or Super Paint, um, you know I had uh, wow. my 1.0 character sheet, and now you can download it from my site. But the problem is, uh, you know I don't have a soft copy of that anymore, at least not to my knowledge. So I had to just I fortunately found. Uh, where somebody – I had somebody else's character and I just scanned in the sheet and like took out his character parts. And anyway, that, that's all I have sadly is a scan um, of, of that sheet. Um, but you know, the, so the older sheets um, don't have layers and they were probably made with PageMaker uh, back in the day or something or even something yeah. old like – Super paint, um, right? Uh, but, but the but the newer uh, sheets, I, I really have been trying to lean towards uh, using layering, mostly because I get, you know, a lot of requests for little tweaks um, to the sheet. Like, oh yeah, I, I um, you know, I I love your your sheet, but I don't use the rules for grappling, or or I use my own thing. Can you give me a custom sheet? Well, you know, I can't really do that kind of thing. I, um, you know, for all the different requests I have, but I started thinking about it. And I thought, you know, with layering, um, 
I, I could kind of play to that, though. I could kind of anticipate, um, you know, what kind of things people might want to turn on or off uh, about their sheet and, and kind of, you know, empower them from the beginning to, to, to customize it to some extent. Yeah. I mean, the uh, only... Got, the, okay. Don't go ahead. Oh, I just had a, had a question on, you know, where did this all start for you? I mean, where did it, like, where you yeah. saw... Was it like, you know... TSR put out a good, uh, you know, character sheet, but I could make do just one better. I mean, right, how'd right. this all kind of go off for you? I mean, right. Well, I mean, you know, to some extent, um, the you know, you just start with like kind of necessity, like you know, who uh, as a teenager, I'm not going to be able to run out and buy, you know, character sheets all the time. I can't afford, you know, <laughs> yeah. to to buy these character sheets. So, uh, you know, here I am making, I think I've still got somewhere a middle earth role playing character sheet I made on a ta- with Atari writer. And nice. it, it, it's, it's funny because it's, you know, there's no graphics of course whatsoever. It's just text with blanks. Um, but it's ama- when I saw it, I was like, wow, this must've taken me forever to do it. And <laughs> why, why did I do it? And, um, you know, it was probably cause I just needed a character sheet and didn't want to write on a notebook paper. And, um, you know, so you're just kind of like, well, I'll just make my own. And I think early on, um, you know, what I was doing was essentially just making a copy of whatever character sheet was included with the game. Or, you know, like an approximation anyway. Sure. Um, and it wasn't until later that I started, um, you know, uh, thinking more along terms of, yeah, I could do this better. Or I, I don't like the way this is laid out um, yeah. or, or, or something along those lines. You know, and I think that's something that was common even back then. Because, you know, I remember a friend of mine, he made up a character sheet somehow. I don't know with with his own little graphics and stuff. I don't know how he made it, but I remembered looking, I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, we were talking, you're, we're talking the early eighties. So computer oh, yeah. technology <laughs> wasn't exactly the greatest, let alone photocopy technology. And <laughs> well, I, I know. remember, I remember, I remember getting a copy and I'm like, I'm asking my mom, Mom, do you make me like fifty copies of this when you go to work? <laughs> oh, you did that too, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> my poor, my poor father used to have to go to work, and he'd come home with all these scans of. Uh, uh, I don't think you guys played Starfleet Battles, did you? Yeah. It seemed like I heard. And okay, did, uh, it seemed like in the, one of the podcasts that, that came up. But you remember the yeah. SSDs? You had to to, yeah. to check off boxes of damage. Yeah. Or shit. Oh, oh yeah. I don't know how many thousands of pages that made my father, uh, you know, <laughs> photocopy and bring them to me. Nice. Pain the butt those sheets. <laughs> yeah. The uh, somebody put up recently the ones the armory character sheets. Like I don't. I didn't know the name of the person who did it, but he said it here. It was D. F. Cole, and these were. Put up. They they were printed out entirely with a dot matrix printer, but they right. they looked great. They obviously had been originally done, you know, in sometime in the I guess late seventies, early eighties. You know, the era of the Epson MX eighty and that kind of stuff. Right. Wow. Yeah. I've I you know I'm kind of obsessed with this um, uh, recreating old character sheets now. Um, you know, for posterity or something. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, I was uh, texting earlier that uh, I'm, I actually acquired the original 1977 D&D character sheets and the 1978 Games Workshop character sheets. So I will hopefully soon uh. those will be up on my site in replica form. But I looked at those armory ones and I thought about trying to do the same thing. And I thought, you know, I just don't see that working for the armory sheets because that's – that's just it. It really has to be kind of a bitmap, <laughs> dot yeah. matrix kind of experience. Yeah. Uh, Plus, and, for yeah. that one, it was pretty easy. I, he put the scan up. I just grabbed it, did a, a little bit of level adjustment in Photoshop, and put it back up as a right. PDF. And that right, way, yeah. if somebody really wants it, when they print it out now, it'll look like a dot matrix printer, and that's fun. So, but that's cool. about as far as you want to go with it, really. Yeah. Patrick, when you do your sheets, do you use Photoshop uh, mostly, or because when I did a bunch of sheets for my World of Darkness game, it took me forever to do them in Photoshop. Of course, I'm not as talented as you, but you must well, be able to bang these know, out pretty quickly. Don't sell yourself short, but I'm I'm not much of a uh, Photoshop guy. I'm 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 for whatever reason for years now I've been obsessed with the vector, uh oh, postscript stuff. So. Um, so I I typically work with uh, Adobe Illustrator and uh, Adobe InDesign 
Uh, I mean, you're pretty much you're pretty much yeah. stuck with InDesign these days. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, you know, again, it was um, the paint programs on the Mac back in the day, and then PageMaker, uh, and I think I used uh, oh, Den- Deniba Canvas. Yeah. I think was my graphics program back in yep, college. Yep. Or something like that. But uh, yeah, I've moved on to kind of exclusively now. I'm using uh, Illustrator and InDesign right now. Creator Suite four. Uh, I haven't moved up to five yet, but. Yeah, it's pretty pricey, but still, I mean, I was a huge Quark advocate for years. It's what I used to publish a magazine, and I did all the layout in Quark, but they didn't keep up w- when uh, OS X switched over, and so, you know, you had to kind of pick up the other stuff, and now everybody has learned InDesign, and it's honestly kind of jumped ahead, so what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I never I never used Quark, and I know, uh, you know, it had a lot of diehard adherence and uh, it was but it, it was, was great it, in its day right and it's just a shame because just looking from the outside in it was obvious that they really dropped the ball and um yeah you know handed the market over to adobe yeah i felt bad about it but the important thing is you know these things that you're building you know they're coming out beautifully so and and i agree yeah. with you you really do need to do these fully in postscript and you know in a vector language because otherwise uh they're just not going to to print well as you go across uh you know Right. Yeah, I've, seen, things, yeah. I've seen beautiful things done with uh, with Photoshop, and I mean, you know, oh, uh, sure. certainly if you crank up the resolution and whatever. And well, and of course, you can do vector and Photoshop now. But I would uh, have to, say, I'd have to say when I the first stuff I saw of yours, Patrick, was when I was on Dragonsfoot.org, and they had those goldenrod AD and D character sheets of yours because I was like looking forever for those, you know, or. Because I have copies of them, I try right. to do copies of them. You don't myself. want to use the copies. <laughs> yeah, you want to and save the copies. So, yeah. Exactly, and I I have whatever I had, but I was like, oh my gosh, he made a PDF of them. This is fantastic. It's beautiful. I'm like, the only thing I wish he would do right now is like have a whole bunch of like little active fields in there now. Oh, well, nice. let me tell you about that. <laughs> I've actually, I I think I sent you an email about this a while back, Patrick. I've actually finished. Um, putting in active fields for the front page for the fighter. Okay. So, yeah, so, but the thing is, and this is where the, the layers come into place, I'm going to have to actually split these apart into s- separate files for each one because, unfortunately, when you create, um, use interactive fields in a PDF, it, they don't go away with the layer. Yeah. And, this, and this is one of the reasons, you know, people ask me all the time, why do you not, you know, why can't you make a form version of this? And um, for one thing, it's a huge pain in the rear. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can agree with that. It makes the file size a lot bigger, too. <laughs> I right. have, I, it, it, let me put it this way. To do the forms on the front page alone, first of all, you want to go through and you want to you align them really carefully. You want to get the right kind of input into them. You want to yeah. have the tab order set well. You want to get everything so that you know, the font size good so that when they're printed out, they'll look right. Um, so doing all of that, just getting the front page was about 10 hours of work. Right, and yeah. so the, you know, the, that's why I tell them. What first off, it's a huge pain. It takes a lot of work, and frankly, I'd rather be making more sheets and spending my time developing form right. fields for all these things. But since I have moved into layers, as Jason's saying, that's the really dumb thing. I don't understand why this works this way. But there's essentially only one layer for forms, and so um, you can turn on and off all the form, all the layers you want. Um, you're stuck with that that one form layout. So um, actually, so this is a good time to mention this. If anybody wants to make form versions of my sheets, I highly encourage that, and that's why I release them under the Creative Commons license, so that uh, there's a nice legal way to do that. And I would oh, be okay. happy. I would be happy to, um, you know, in a case like this, um, make a separate fighter, or cleric, druid, you know, whatever forms of the first page, because I know that. Um, you know, the layered version is just not going to play well um, with, with a form version. You know, what might be a good idea is if anybody does want to you know, help out on that, since I've uh, gone a little ways down that road, rather than duplicating, we should probably connect up. So if anybody out there is interested in doing that, you know, drop us a line. Oh, and I'm sure we, we can... have listeners who might be savvy in that. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe we can coordinate and uh, get them all done and you know, pass them back to Patrick. Well, and the good news is I don't know which ver- you know, uh, what version of Acrobat or whatever you're using to do that, but I, I did notice that the automatic 
form creation in Acrobat 9 handles a second page pretty well. <laughs> uh, so I've it, never really tried it because it, it, I've tried it a couple of times before and it just was such a mess. Maybe the yeah. new one's better. Yeah, usually with character sheets, it's just uh, it's just a disaster. And I even got excited because I stuck in um, um, oh one of the spell planners, right? So mm-hmm. I've got duplicates of the spell planners up there, or ones that I've created for castles, and crusades, or uh, whatever. And of course, they've got all those little check boxes for you know have you memorized the spell or whatever. And so I, I fed that through the um, I think I'm uh, using Acrobat Nine. Um, um, you know, wizard, and it, you know, it's like, oh wow, it, I, it, it thought about it for a second, and it put a little field in for all the little check boxes, and I was like, oh, thank goodness, I can just, you know, post this as is. And then I noticed that every one of those little check boxes it had made into a tiny text field. Oh, <laughs> not, not a check box. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yes. No. Um, so I thought, okay, well, back back to square one. But um, but yes, forms are uh, a gigantic drag, and um, uh, I avoid making them. I, I understand the desire to have them, and I like having them, but um, I guess I've just decided that in most cases uh, I'd rather spend my time doing something else. It just shows even now, like doing the, doing the form fields, it's still a drag. It's still a pain to do, even with, with, the, with the tools that we have. It's right. just... Oh. Well, most of the time you're not going to need that. I mean, that's the thing. Is right. If you're talking about playing uh, with your friends you know, around a tabletop, you're going to bring these things and you're going to print them out and you're going to write on them. But uh, in our Skype game, I would have found it easier if people could submit things that they filled out as forms. So that's kind of the reason that I'm trying to set those up. I, and, I, I don't and, think there's a real reason otherwise. Right. And attention, Adobe, if you're out there, here's a free tip. If you would just put those field creation tools in InDesign, I could make the layout and anticipate, you know, the form at the same time. <laughs> I could just, that would you know, be nice. I could spit out a print version and a form version, um, you know, right at the same time. I don't understand why that capability doesn't exist. Just throwing that out there. Yes, that's a freebie, <laughs> Adobe. Adobe, if you're listening. Well, we're just about, we're, we're, we're getting close to running out of time in this segment, but I wanted to get one last question in about these because... I wanted to know how much, especially in this particular character sheet, looking at the Goldenrod ones, how much did you have to recreate completely from scratch, and how much did you scan or bring over? That's a that's a really good question. Um, I definitely start with a scan, um, you know, like at least a 300 or 600 DPI scan. And, um, uh, you know, like that crazy... Uh, stuff on the side, the little floral thing that uh, TSR had going. Who knows where that came from? Um, so, you know, I scan it in as high as a resolution I could and then uh, try to bring it in the Illustrator, trace it, try to clean up the past and things so it's not... Oh, so when it. I look at something like the, you've got the little boot that's around the move base, that classic picture of the boot, did you actually uh, retrace that in Vector? Uh, actually, I had Illustrator trace it in vector and then I cleaned it up and nice. Yeah. And so, uh, and then, um, I used the, um, the scan as a background layer in, uh, in design so mm-hmm. that I could then place the text exactly where, um, I had the, where the text was in the original, same thing with drawing the boxes for the lines and that kind of thing. So, but uh, you're actually putting, you're actually using, well, not PostScript necessarily, or open type. You're using real fonts here. You're not. Just, yeah, I was uh, actually using the souvenir font that uh, um, that they use in those sheets. Uh, oh, I mean, obviously they were using Letraset or some other typesetting uh, deal that you know was a '70s thing. But but otherwise, yeah, I'm using the same typeface, and it, it's uh, yeah, it is actually text. It's not. Um, yeah. Well, now we have a thing that we do on our um, – we have a, 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 an iPhone app, and we have the ability to put PDFs into it. You know, So if somebody's got the app, they can get a little bonus. And I think we have some things to include this time around. We should definitely include your character sheet as a PDF for anybody who's got the iPhone app. But another thing is there's a great uh, guide to the TSR font usage that somebody put together a while back. And the PDF's been go- – I think it's um, – Artie DeVark? Yeah. That's yes. a fake name. Artie 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 with a couple of those, yes. Okay, obviously Artie Vark is not his name. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's but not? Uh, we should put that PDF in because it has a list of what all of these fonts were. Like you say, they were actually Letraset. This is before you could have desktop publishing. But 
you know, these are things coming from, from Linotype or coming from Agfa or whoever. So it's probably the right fonts, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I helped him with a couple of those. And uh, as far as I can tell, he's dead on uh, with all of them. And, and it's certainly a huge uh, huge step toward kind of recreating the, the the trade dress, you know, that was there before. And, you know, this is what I'm – like I'm looking at these games workshop sheets from the 80s. I, I have been banging my head against the wall now for two days trying to figure out what font, um, what the typeface is the games workshop used. Um, have you have you tried some of those tools like what the font et cetera? Oh yes, uh, what the font. It doesn't Dinafont. work so good. No, I, in fact, I thought a dinner font would work because in that one, um, and yeah, I can hear people sleeping right now out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Games Workshop is England. We don't know. <laughs> they do right. things. There. They but, do things. Uh, yes, yeah, I posted something on their forums, and uh, sometimes people will chime in and. Um, but a lot of times, everybody's stumped. So well, a lot Patrick, of times, it's a question of oh. digging up the original designers, maybe. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, well, what what is it that you're uh, currently playing now, as far as as far as, uh, role playing games? What is it that you are trying to? Uh, well, I'm skinny? looking. I'm looking for a first edition game. Uh, there's a plug. So anybody, um, particularly if you're in the Baltimore, DC area. Uh, Please keep me in mind. Uh, there will be character sheets. I can promise you, you that. You got two Skype games you can <laughs> yeah. get into. That's yeah. true. That's true. I should think about that. Uh, actually, at the moment, um, uh, the the only game I'm playing is uh, an Ars Magica game. Don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's actually one of my one of my favorites uh, favorite games. Certainly my favorite non D and D first edition uh, game. And I actually have some you know professional credits in that line. Um, but um, my wife and I are playing in a in a game there. But uh, okay. cool. uh, unfortunately, no first edition. So somebody, somebody hit me up. Yeah. <laughs> well, while we have you on the line here, you could probably help us out with this. Maybe give us some advice. Uh, as Jason and I had spoke about last episode, designing our own DM screen for the RFI podcast. An idea that I uh, threw around with Jason for a while, and then we decided, what the hell? Why don't we do this and see how it works out? So yeah, I heard about that too. Oh yeah, and Nick too. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Nick. Yeah, hey. Nick, Nick as well. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. And uh, I know it's okay, Jason. You've been plunging ahead with this uh, project, and you started designing a lot on your own. I noticed you gave me a PDF of what you've been doing <laughs> so far, because you're like, yeah, hand in every project, gotta go forward. So, well, yeah, and you know me because I mean, I got my start as a print designer, so yeah. I get pretty excited when there's an opportunity to do to pull out InDesign. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so so first of all, let me kind of introduce this in a little bit more formal way for our audience, and then we can talk about it a little bit as well. What we're going to do, like like Vince, like you were just saying, uh, so Vince had this idea: what if we had our own role for initiative DM screen? Which I thought was a great idea. There's been projects like that out there before, definitely. Um, but what we want to do is one that, uh, you know, we're going to make it actually look just like the old, gold, you know, the first uh, 9028 screen with the golden, or 9024 screen with the golden uh, paper and everything like that. And Hanai is actually redoing the artwork right now. So we've got our little RFI guys in the scenes. Nice. Nice. And, yeah. So it's actually, we'll have original artwork, but it'll be a, 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 an homage to the original. Uh, but what we need to do is we have to figure out, well, what are we going to put on it? Because I think everybody would agree that there's things they would do differently if they had a chance. No so I thought we could take uh, this segment to talk about a couple of things. One, maybe we could all throw around some ideas of things that we like and don't like about the screens and would do differently. And the other one, since we got Patrick here, is talk a little bit about things that might get a little print geeky for some people, but I'd like to know. And that's things like, you know, going back and trying to recreate some of the old, uh, you know, um, pasteboard layout letter set feel when you're working in uh, a, an actual desktop publishing program and things like right. that. So let's right. uh, so let's start out with the with the kind of techie stuff so we can get that out of the way, and then we can start talking about the things we actually want to put in there. Okay. So, uh, so Patrick, the, what we're do, thinking about doing for this, and I, I mentioned Game Crafters before. There's a, there's a company called the Game Crafters that they're like Cafe Press or Lulu, but for games. Right. So if you want to get a DM screen printed or even a boxed set of games with tokens and everything, they'll do it for you. No money up front. You, know, you pay when you buy it. 
So we're going to be able to actually make the screen and people can actually purchase it. Okay. Uh, but the thing is, when you look at the old DM screens, I mean, you can see that these were pasteboard jobs. These were, pa- these were actual paste-ups. Have you thought about how to make things look right in that sense? Hmm. Well, uh, I, you know, I have, yeah, I can feel your pain about the, the, the screen. So I, I'm trying to think if, which I think I've got maybe two screens, uh, for download on my site. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, I was just worried about trying to make it fit into this. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, the, uh, customizable, uh, GM screen that uh, Savage Worlds people yes. have. Uh, yeah, I see that. Yep. So you know, uh, essentially, just so people can print stuff out and then slide in a new panel, and boom, you've got you know your your new game, and that's that's all well and good. But um, you know, I'm really uh, we're talking about you know the look and feel of the old school stuff and that love for that uh, that vibe. So I, I'm really excited about this project you guys are talking about um is certainly um have run into this problem of trying to kind of keep uh, keep the quirkiness maybe of the old i'm stuff. actually oh. seriously thinking about at doing it the old school way actually doing paste ups and if there's a if there is a shop in new york if there is a service bureau that still has a stat camera actually wow. shooting it Hmm. Right. Oh, wow. That'd be fascinating. Because, I mean, yeah, like when I'm trying to recreate these sheets, you you wouldn't believe like all the quirky uh, letting and character spacing issues that you're you're like, okay, I'm using the same font. I'm, uh, you know, it's the exact size of this thing. And you like type out the word and look at it compared to the original. And And it's just not quite. It's just not quite there because, uh, because, again, you're talking about a digital medium. Uh, versus what they were doing back then, and uh, and you know, yeah, if you want to keep that, um, if you want to be really authentic, then yeah, sometimes that might be the way you have to do it. I usually say when it comes to design, and what I do now is user experience, which is a little more specialized version of design. But you know, when it comes to design, I usually compare it to cooking. You know, the average person or music. You know, the average person could not tell you why one thing isn't quite – why that dinner isn't like the dinner they had before, why the music's not like the music they heard, or why the print doesn't look the same. They're not sure why, but they can tell. Right. You know, there's just something – like something's off. I can't tell you what's off, and that's the kind of thing. Je ne sais quoi. Je ne sais quoi. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, you look at the DM screen and you can see exactly what you're talking about. You see those little places where things aren't quite aligning exactly. And I can actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think I can see that this square was done by hand because I can see where the ink didn't quite touch right. And what you can see a little bit of the actual uh, layout person's hand in, in this thing. Are you looking at the original gold one? Yeah, I am. Mm, okay. I have to look at a couple of them to make sure, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, I kind of noticed that too with some of them. Yeah, and it's 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 part of what makes it neat. You know, it's what yeah. gives, it, gives it that old school feel. J- uh, uh, Michael last week from Dead Game Society was talking about things like artificially uh, putting some distress into the design, but I think it's better to just make it and then you know let it be brand new, although you've made it. You know, in this way, and then you know, just go ahead and let people use it, and after a year, it'll look you know just as old as everything else, I guess. So let's talk about the stuff that goes on it. Yes. Hmm. All well, right. So um, let's get rid of psionics. Th- okay. So let me kick <laughs> off. Let me kick off with an idea I have about that. Um, I th- my idea is that I would like to still do the dual trifold screens so that it's actually, you know, the same exact setup. But I think it would be really helpful since now we're in a situation where we can do print on demand, so there's no limit to the number of things we could make. Um, it's just limited by how much we feel like designing. Yeah. We could make a series of maybe little bifold uh, two-panel specialty screens that could go with it. And I think Psionic is, is a perfect example of that because if you look on the original right. screen... Not the second printing, but the first one. The psionics takes up two full panels of this. Yeah. And like you say, most people don't play with psionics. Yeah, but most, some people most do. Don't. I know I didn't. 
Well, I'm going to try to. I mean, we've had a couple of people comment on the website saying, well, are you just against it? And I thought no. about it. I thought, no, I just don't know how to do it right. Right. Neither did I. I was like, I still look at it and I'm like, huh? <laughs> yeah, but psionics should definitely, I think, be taken off of the main screen because it's just not common enough. Agreed. So what I was thinking about was that there could be a bunch of what I'm calling special situation and uh, special rule screens. Like a Vince example, screen or a Nick screen, or so yeah. So let's say special rule screens. Screen? Um, a Nick screen. Things, yeah. yeah, you know. So there's there's stuff that you take from Dragon Magazine or that you've house ruled for yourself that you really like and you want to have it for yourself. So each one of us could have our own edition. There's the Nick edition, hmm. the Vince edition, the Jason edition. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So people could say, well, I want to play by the book, or I want to play the way that Vince plays. Or I want to play the way that Jason plays. Because none so of us like, play if exactly. I wanted a list of like all the different, you know, clerics with all the different types of weapons that they can use, I could have that on my screen. Exactly. <laughs> you may <laughs> certainly have just that. Just throw now. that out there. Just an idea. So, but it's a really good idea. You could have. Yeah. So this is what I was thinking. Sort of like you've got splat books. We should have splat screens. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty cool. And, and in a way, it, and we're also talking. It sounds like function here, too, because you know, form follows function. Uh, in this case, yeah. it makes it modular. You know, you can you can make it your own and add things, and it's like layering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like layering. I, I was thinking for special situations. Okay, so there's the, those kind of things, but also special situations that are by the book, but they don't come up as often. You might just want to pull them out. So psionics is one. Um, I had also list- overbearing. No, because I n- n- let's come back to that in a second. But okay. um, I had written down uh, shipboard. You know, so if you're on a ship, all of a sudden you have all these extra things you have to pay attention to, like uh, ship movement and swimming and all that kind of stuff that doesn't normally come up. But when it does, you want it all there. Uh, wilderness, a, a special wilderness screen, an air combat screen, a large scale battle screen. So something for you know maybe from whichever system you like, and then splat screens for the different uh, class and race specialties. I've always liked, for for example, for, for combat situations, and I think this comes up for a lot of DMs, is like for damage for uh, flasks of oil and the splash radius. Also well, that's the like grenades. That. That's, there, that's true. There's the grenades section on the screen. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something needs to be on there for sure. You're absolutely right. I just think it takes up too much space right now. An initiative well, uh, uh, section should be in there, like how you do your initiative. Oh, yeah. Well, that would be, that cool. would be the Jason special one because I don't play by the book for initiative. Well, I do the same thing as you almost, so I would have a special initiative as well. Yeah. So we would want to do a, uh, a a section for by the book initiative that would be on the real screen. Mm-hmm. And then if you wanted to get the, the Jason edition, for example, then it would have... The one, the way I do it. Call it the the main screen, not the real screen. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> the main well, I think screen. The on, the, on the main screen, you would have obviously attack matrices for all matrices for all yep. the different classes and the monsters. Uh, uh, cleric turning undead. Yeah, chart. keep that. Yep, monster keep that. Uh, monster attack matrix. Two, two don't forget. Monster attack matrix. Yes. Saving throws. Saving throw matrix. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Let's see what else is kind of a given. I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head here. Okay, well, I'll tell you what you would not have. <laughs> you would, like you said, the psionics would come off of the main screen. You definitely mm-hmm. do not need to have the assassins table for assassinations. No, no, no. <laughs> that, I mean, that would be like on the secondary screen, yeah. Yeah, if that. Um, equipment and supplies cost. Uh, mm. The grenade-like missiles that takes up half a panel. Uh, the level experience... Yeah points needed, number of spells per level, stuff that you only have to look up when you're leveling up. I mean, leave it in the book. Yeah. What yeah. do you guys think about uh, travel times, like wilderness travel? Yes. Kind of thing? Yes, I always yes. like to have that right, right at hand. You know what I would always like to have is also the, uh, um, the treasure matrix. What's that? What do the you treasure mean? type the, uh, matrix. Roll, you mean the uh, randomly select? That's good. The treasure types, you know, that's listed in the monster manual in the back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, in the back of the DMG with the, all the monsters as a. Well, yeah, it's in the back of the monster manual. It has treasure types A through Z. What you know? Them, what each of them mean? Yeah. Yeah, that would. Oh, and, okay. Hold on, I'm looking I think right that now. That would be nice to have. 
but you wouldn't have to make. Oh it yeah, because it's only it's only a single page. This could easily be redesigned to fit on half a panel. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think that would be a handy one to have. Oh, you know what you have to have on the DM screen is your um, your uh, monetary value or the what do you call it? Exchange rates. You know. Platinum yes, pieces. I was thinking of that too. Exchange Everybody's rates. always <laughs> trying to remember what an Electrum piece is worth. Yes. <laughs> Gary Gygax's very famous coinage, the Electrum piece. <laughs> yeah. Because um, they're always in the Against the Giants. I don't get that. <laughs> well, something I want to put on, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this, but I have a number of flow charts that I've designed. And uh, they, they work really well for me. I keep them around to kind of re- – I, I don't sit there and obviously look through a flow chart as I'm doing each thing. But sometimes I want to be reminded about a strange thing that's going on. So, for example, I've created a combat flow chart that goes from you know, init- initial encounter and determining distance, you know, surprise and that type of stuff. Then through oh. all the steps – and it has all the steps that you would go through. So this flow chart you know, goes through surprise, how many segments of surprise, take action for this many segments, players announce their actions, you know, all those type of things. And includes things such as attempting to de-engage and when you get your free attack and the plus four to hit and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, that would be really good to have. And I've already designed these. You know, so again, since I'm an information architect, I play with flow charts way too much. Hmm. But uh, I've created one for the uh, combat. I've created an initiative diagram that shows how you figure um, when you have multiple attacks, you know, how a, uh, an archer gets to go first and then last and that type of thing. Um, I've got the flow chart, which I did. Now, you mentioned weaponless and uh, non-lethal combat. Right. So I think we should definitely have a second screen that's available or even have an alternate version of the main screen for people that prefer the Unearthed Arcana version of yeah. weaponless combat because a lot of people prefer that. But mm-hmm. um, if people want to have the by the book DMG version, I have – that's the one I sent to you, Vince. I've made yeah, a flow yeah. chart for that. Yeah, that was uh, pretty cool. You did a good job so far. And then I was like, wow, pretty impressed thank by you. that. Are we yeah, going to offer – um, we're offering another three counter. What about Oriental Adventures? There are some people that do play yeah. that. So we have Absolutely. to probably we consider We need to figure that. out how to work those in. I think what yeah. we should do is – Get our main screen put together. Yeah, maybe yeah. a couple of extra ones, and we can keep on, you know, offering more and more as if people like it and if they want more. You know what I really like, but I know it it doesn't really follow the old school feel. But like how they have the newer screens that are shorter. I don't oh know yeah, if you've seen those, yeah. so it's easier to see over as a GM, and you don't have this high tall screen like you're a big. No, guy. I want a wall. No, <laughs> I like I, the I have shorter to confess, screens. I think the new screens. They make more sense that they're oriented that way. I, I don't think we should do them because they, it wouldn't look like the old ones. But I got to admit, they, that does kind of make sense. I, I, yeah, I kind of like the shorter ones only for the simple fact that you don't have to be you don't have this big giant wall and you're not like this monster behind it. But <laughs> well, I, when I GM, I, I stand anyway, so it's like same here. Yeah, yeah. I never mean to, but I find myself standing up for four hours, five hours at a time. Anyway, you did yeah, the whole time we too. played our game at Gen Con, you stood up the whole time. That's right, I did, huh? Yeah. It just feels natural. You sat down for like half a second, and then someone asked a question, you were like, whoop, out of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Patrick? You got any ideas? Well, I yeah, I actually agree with everything you guys have just said. I mean, um, I, I kind of prefer the new style. Uh, the lower the lower ones seem like, you know, it's less of a barrier between, you know, me as a GM and, and the players. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, yeah, like Jason said, if you're trying to trying to look old school, I mean, you you've, you've got to have the the, the portrait uh, layout, I think. Yeah, yeah. and we're definitely yeah. going to go with it because we're trying to make it look a lot like that. You know, I've even done the role for initiative logo in the uh, um, what is the font? Uh, uh, Quentin. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, boy, I tell you, we had uh, I had a lot of fun. You know, I I was involved with uh, Bully Pulpit Games. Uh, don't know if you guys are familiar with them. Mostly yeah. the indie, uh, the indie scene, uh, Forge crowd, and and that kind of thing. With a couple of my friends from back in North Carolina, and uh, I'm I'm extricating myself from that for lack of time. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, we were going to do was publish some old school. Dungeon modules, which I hope to still publish on my own, but uh, uh, you mean from I, Dungeon I, Magazine? Um, well, no, just uh, you know, old school modules. I wrote myself. You know, hey, in this day and age, oh, you can publish cool. your own dungeons. So you know, why don't I? Uh, but I yeah. can't tell you how much time I wasted uh, making the bully pulpit 
logo with the old fonts and uh, the old layout. And, you know, uh, our, our, our kind of idol at Bully Pulpit was Teddy Roosevelt. That's where he named yeah. oh, right. he named after. And my, so I, I did my the My favorite logo. president. My oh, yeah. favorite Mine too. And uh, I redid the, the Bully Pulpit logos, uh, or the TSR logos, so like the, the one with like the wizard's face and TSR. Uh, it's, I had it with Teddy's face and BPG. and That big old toothy um, grin. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, and, the, and uh, you know, uh, the Maze logo that they used to have, TSR, replaced with BPG. And just, you know, using the old trade dress style, but, um, but with Bully Pulpit kind of stuff so um unfortunately i guess those won't see the light of day but uh I'll, I'll i'll do the same thing when i finally publish these so cool well this is great so um patrick hopefully you'll stay in touch with us and uh kind of get involved with this project a little bit with us absolutely i'd love to help All right well uh let's go ahead and wrap up the guest segment for now and patrick you'll stick around with us for the rest of the show i hope sure thing Okay, Great. so uh, let's wrap this up so that we can move on to our next segment, Table Manners. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world, I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. All right, um, today we're on table matters we're going to be talking about uh, some of the applications that we have available for online virtual gaming for uh, for our tabletop games and uh, it seems like we have a a uh, virtual gaming tabletop guru amongst us which is Vince <gasps> me <laughs> yeah you what i don't know what you're talking about I, that's what you told me i lied oh well okay end of segment then on <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that'll guess, end the uh, show this week. Fo- oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess you've uh, experienced like all these different types of uh, mm. uh, uh, applications for uh, yeah. for computers uh, for online, like Open RPG. I'm familiar with yeah. a little bit, but some of the other ones I'm not all too familiar with. You can just kind of right. maybe we can do in. an overview of uh, you know what what different yeah, what ones there are out is. there. So we got Open RPG. I think I think that was like one of the first really no. decent ones that was out there, wasn't it? No. No. There was okay, a- I'm actually <laughs> <laughs> I moved around a lot uh, in the past uh, 10 or so years, so I had not a stable group until I actually found some friends. So I did a lot of online gaming. The first one was Web RPG. Oh, oh you, that's what it was. Yeah. Web RPG. You actually logged into a website, and then you it was I think it was a Java based thing. It might have been. I don't know what it was yes. exactly. But you went in, you found room, and you clicked on it, and it popped up another screen, and it was kind of like Open RPG. And you did all your gaming in that little room. There was no voice enabled. It was all chat, and most people didn't have the ability to use Skype back then. So everything was just text chat, roll the dice, and it was pictures. And but that was the first one. Open RPG is somewhat dying now. I don't think a lot of people use it anymore. It's not as popular, but there's still somewhat hmm. of a crowd that's around it. Really? It's huh. That makes me feel bad, because I, I when, when we were looking at the group, that was one of the ones that appealed the most to me. Yeah, this, there's still a bunch of servers. Like, OpenRPG works with servers. Like, someone has a server you connect, and that's Another how, reason I like it. Yeah, so you don't have to host it on your own computer and go through the hassle, you know, putting up the firewall, the ports opening, all that other bull crap. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the room has a chat room, and you have the ability to make up your own characters and put them in little macros on the side so everybody could see it, and you can click a button, and boom, it shows in the chat room. There's a right-hand space for a map with uh, icons that everybody can move around with. The DM can just control it on his own. So That's it's a pretty cool. neat software, and it was really big, I want to say five or six years ago. Not well, really one of the anymore. things I liked best in looking about at that was that a lot of the ones we were looking at, they were over-designed to me. It looked like mm. you were playing a video game. Yeah, yeah. And open RPG didn't look like that, and I didn't, you know, so that appealed to me, the idea that it didn't impose any type of graphics oh. on the players. Best of all, it's free. Yeah, actually, could oh, I? Oh, that's why I, I liked it so much. Yeah. <laughs> what I wanted to ask about is if, you know, before we go into some of the specifics, I, I have a little bit of a rundown of what I saw as... The, the basics of each one, and maybe you could tell me if this is right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so so with Open RPG, you're talking about one here that's free, right? 
as you say, it's open source, meaning anybody can contribute to it. So it's got a, and it looks like it has a very uh, rich community around it. There's a great wiki, a lot of support, people talking about it. Some people have um, actually contributed to making their own version of it, but I haven't seen it really go anywhere. Good, good. Um, it, it's native on Windows. Um, if you're going to run it on Linux or OS X, you just have to install Python first. Yes. Um, so that could be a little bit of a barrier for some people. True. Yeah, not um, much of a big deal. You can download Python anywhere. Sure, but all of your players have to be, you know, conversant enough to do that if they're, you know, so that there's that side of it. Um, yeah, and then yeah, you've yeah, got um, Fantasy Grounds, which uh, is... Two. Fantasy Grounds 2. Sorry, Fantasy Grounds 2, one of the most slick ones. Um, $40 for the DM mm-hmm. and uh, $24 for each player, although they do offer discounts for groups. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure which platforms that ran on, though. Uh, it only runs on the Windows platform, as far as I know. There might be a Mac one, but I never. I don't have a okay, Mac, so, so I wouldn't know. Could be a drawback if you have players with more than Windows in the group. Mm-hmm. Um, D20 Pro. This oh. one's on all platforms, which is mm-hmm. a, a plus. Yeah. Um, similar pricing, a little bit less. $30 for the DM, and you can have two guests. Otherwise, it's $10 a player. Right, it's... Probably the um, best one so far for money wise. Good. Okay, that's good. That's a good point. Um, okay. Battlegrounds, which uh, they have Windows and Mac, but they do not support Linux. And I would suspect that a good number of people who are kind of uh, grognardy enough to be playing first edition AD and D might also be Linux uh, users. So that, but other than that, it's thirty seven dollars for the DM, twenty dollars a player. And it's also uh, uh, a dying too. I noticed Battlegrounds. Okay, that, that says something there. Yeah. Um, and then Epic Table, which is not out yet, but uh, looks promising, although it's going to be Windows only. Mm. And uh, they're not going to be releasing with, with hex grids right away, but they do have a lot of other good things like True Vision. And then um, the other one, Map Tools, which is free. Or also and known as, as RPG as Tools, I, yeah. Okay, so that's, so that's the one that, that I was most familiar with, but I haven't had a chance to use any of them. So Map Tools, which is, is free cross platform because it's a java client mm-hmm. and um you said it's the extension of web rpg no uh map tools and rpg tools are pretty much the same thing it just depends oh, okay. on what's what you plug into it most people call it map tools some people call it rpg tools it just depends on who uses it pretty much oh, okay same thing so- so so the, now you've used most of these uh yeah i think the only one i really haven't used too much is d20 pro but uh, I don't. I chose to stay away from the ones that charge you anything because I, there's all these free ones out there. So what do I need to want to charge yeah. you? Like, for, for although instance, Michael from Dead Game Society uh, sounded like he was a big fan of the D20 Pro. It, it, because all D20 Pro is, like as it says, it's made for D20 based games, and all the mm-hmm. macros and all everything to, that has to do with the, the feats and the rules are all there for you. Done. Click of the button. You don't have to program anything. That's probably why he enjoys d20 pro because he ha- plays a lot of d20 games so so for somebody that is just uh wants to go in and pick up and just play right away is d20 that pick up and play yeah you could probably pick up d20 pro and uh buy it same thing with fantasy grounds 2 uh, really? fantasy grounds 2 is actually like you said more of like looks like you're playing a video game well d20 pro definitely looks like a video game yeah. to me uh, but Fantasy Grounds 2 looks like a virtual tabletop, like an actual table, and you could pick up little pictures of dice and throw them on the screen, and you actually see it rolls, it makes a sound effect, and the dice rolls across the screen, bounces off, and you get okay. your roll. And you can also assign various sounds, and you can have little characters, and the map screen's a little confusing at sometimes, but you get used to it. There's a lot of features on Fantasy Grounds. Lots well, now, I'm looking at the screenshots of Fantasy Grounds, mm-hmm. and, the, you know, the, the, the windows have all this decoration around them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they, they are using fonts that are meant to evoke fantasy, and there's... Yeah. I, I don't know. When I look at it, I, I feel very uh, much like I have to think that I'm, like, I'm playing a video game. Maybe when you use it, it doesn't feel the same way. I... I don't know. I just didn't really... I didn't like it. It was a little complicated at first. I got used to it. It was just. It has a learning curve, and it's kind of graphical heavy when you look at it. I mean... You yeah, said, that's like I said, guess the, what I was trying to say. You yeah. said it better. Yeah, yeah, all the pictures and everything. Some people, maybe, like, you know, Grognards would have an older computer. It may not run as fast and fancy. 
Well, I so, think these grognards probably have a very powerful computer. They just don't want to be running Windows or something. Well, that too. Oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> well, they could be using their Apple IIe still, so who knows? Well, that would be me. Yeah, that would be actually, you. <laughs> actually, you know, Patrick, I was going to point out to you, um, I don't know if you know about the uh, con that we're planning for next year, but uh, we're going to be doing a con called Low Tech Con, and included in that will be old school computer gaming, which means there's a very high likelihood that there will be somebody there with an Atari 800 <laughs> that can run discs for us. Okay, excellent point. No, yeah, I had, I had been following that uh, with interest. So, yeah, there's, there, there'll be a good chance for that. But, you know, what I was just thinking about is I was looking at, again, you know, looking at old Dragon magazine because I <laughs> do that too much. Yeah. But this one from 1983 has uh, these guys, uh, Cabal Gaming Systems that made uh, these dungeon floor modules, these dungeon tiles. And I don't usually like dungeon tiles because the ones that I see people sell now look kind of like that, uh, that gaming, the virtual gaming table. They're way over-designed, whereas these looked almost like graph paper with just a little bit of extra stuff to them. And when I first saw the picture of these, I thought, boy, I wish somebody was selling them still. And it made me realize when I'm doing this, I want the least amount of interface getting in the way of the game. Yeah, I yeah I, I don't like dungeon tiles too. I usually just use the battle map and uh, just mm-hmm. the markers. That's about it. So I mean, it's one of the things when I look at the different virtual tools that are out there, it reminds me of something that Edward Tufte calls chart junk. Chart junk. Uh, yeah. So Edward Tufte, for anybody who's not familiar with him, he's the uh, sort of the father of modern information design. And I mean, by information design, you know, being able to take complex data and turn it into understandable charts. I'm not talking about USA Today infographics. I'm talking about the kind of things that you see that you'd use, say, like in a military presentation when you really need people to understand something. You know, for example, uh, when the space shuttle was, uh, you know, sadly destroyed, the uh, uh, was it the Challenger? Yeah. Back in the 80s? Yeah, Challenger. Mm -hmm. 86. 86, Yes. Yeah, because the O-rings failed. Uh, it was Edward Tufte that showed that one of the reasons that they weren't able to see the problem was that they'd been looking at the wrong kind of charts. If they'd been visualizing their data the right way, they would have instantly seen where these O-rings were failing, and it would have helped. So that's kind of background of what kind of stuff he does. And he talks about when you're trying to present things, don't design your data. Don't put in what he calls chart junk, a bunch of junk around the chart to try to make it prettier and more interesting because you're trying to focus on the data itself Itself. so you can enjoy that. And I have the same approach to interface design, which is don't let me see the interface. Get that out of my way. Let me see the game or let me see the document or whatever I'm working on. And I, so far it's kind of why I like that first one, the open source one. What was it called again? Open Open RPG. Yeah, open RPG. Yeah, I mean, I haven't used it yet, but am I thinking the right way? Does it have that feel a bit more? Yeah. It does. Yeah, definitely. I've seen it, and I have it on my computer, and I could, there's I could a lot definitely of stuff vouch you for can, it. There's a lot of stuff you can program into RPG. Just no one has really taken the time. Well, there are people who have, but no one really takes the time to actually sit down and do it. There's so much stuff you can do with it. Well, maybe I'll give it a try. Yeah, you, there was people who put, like, entire books of how to design their character for their game inside OpenRPG when I was playing certain games, and all you had to do was click a button, and you can do this, and this special role did that. So it was a lot of fun playing back then. Well, okay, so that, you bring up a good point. That's the other side of the virtual tabletops. Is one side is just showing your players where they are and you know the questions of whether they can have maps uploaded to them. But the other side is all the tools that come with it, like character creation, initiative handling, mm-hmm. dice rolling, and that kind of stuff. How do those compare for you? As far as uh, the different The different systems? ones, yeah. Well, OpenRPG, I think, has the best system out of all of them. It's very customizable. Uh, you, you can do whatever you want for whatever system. Uh, I mean, I've seen people play Deadlands on there, the original one, when they actually use deck of cards to use. Oh, wow. Yeah, they've, people have designed deck of cards initiative in that. So you can't do that in Fantasy Grounds. You can't do that in Battlegrounds. Maybe you can do that in Map Tools. I'm not sure. I don't know how to program Map Tools, but Epic well, Table. Well, what I understand, Map Tools is pretty extensible. I know that somebody has created an Osric, uh yes. kit pack for it. That's right, they have, that's correct. Hmm. I don't know how to program it, I know people keep saying it's not that hard, but I really don't have the time to 
Like yeah, you I know said. somebody wrote into us and said, "Hey, you know, just go do it. It's not that hard." But okay, yeah, honestly, I can't remember who wrote into us. Please give me a call and help me understand how it's not that hard because I would really like to jump into it. And actually, Epic Table, Jason, I actually had written to the uh, uh, the I want what designer? Yeah, yeah, designer of that, and he said once it hits beta, he'll uh, he'll send us a copy so we can try it out for our games. Cool. Fun. So uh, all three of us can, if we want to do a beta game for him and just test it out after he gets off the alpha stage. Well, you know. ask him if he can do something for our listeners that we can provide maybe a special beta program for listeners. Yeah. I think that would be a great treat for people who want to try it you out. You know what? I'll Once send the beta comes out, maybe we can use that for our next Creature Feature Theater. Yeah. What do sure. you think? I like it. I yeah, like I'll, it. I'll, give, I'll, I'll forward you his email address, Jason. You can uh, shoot him an email. Okay. So, yeah, those are the programs we used back in the day. It's what I use now. And, Nick, do you use any of these programs at all other than OpenRPG? Or? I'm familiar with OpenRPG. I've seen it used, and I've played around with it on my computer. Just if I ever was going to get into uh, an online game, I would think, for, for me, that's the best bang for your buck because it doesn't yeah. cost you anything. It's, and, I, yeah. and it's the most... And it's the most... It's like the... OGL of these yeah. type of of these type of pr- applications really I just like how like you said how easily programmed it is doesn't matter what game mechanic what game system that you use um, and then I'm sure people have designed little modules to go into it for specific types of uh, game systems so you can just do- download them in fact I think I did someone did a first edition AD&D one for open RPG it's it- once you read the, the instructions, it's not that hard to program Open RPG. I did at one point, you know, how to program modules and stuff into it. I don't remember anymore now because no one uses it really anymore. If you go to their forums, it's like ghost town now. Unfortunately, it really because I mean maybe I didn't look hard enough because it looked to me like there was a lot of community still around it. Maybe you might have found the old forums because they had to switch forums okay. for some reason. Someone hacked the old forums and spammed it to death. So they had to do a new set of forums, and I think a lot of people got annoyed and didn't re-sign back up. Oh, okay. Yeah. The other ones like D20 Pro and Fantasy Grounds 2, I've heard of. Yeah. I've heard of them, but I am not all too – I'm not really if, familiar with them all. I might have seen them in passing, like yeah. browsing through their website. Then I saw, oh, it cost me the much to buy it. Forget that. This Sorry. Is- <laughs> well, I don't yeah. mind the idea of buying any of these. I mean, I'm perfectly no, yeah. happy as a DM to sit down and spend 40 bucks on a piece of software so my players can have a good time. I just think that it's a little tough if I'm asking the players to all spend $25. Yeah, a that's where I – yeah, I agree. That's where, It's like you're asking well, the players to kick in a Fantasy Grounds has that floating license too, so – that's a good thing. I mean, yeah. I think they are pretty smart about the way they offer group discounts and all of that. Um, and, and, you know, in any of these cases, I mean, we have to put this in some perspective. I mean, how much do you spend on a gaming book? You know, you go out yeah. and you spend $50 on a book, no problem, right? Yeah, yeah, probably. So, I mean, these guys put a lot of work into what they do. And this, every one of these, every one of these looks like they're just amazingly complex, huge labors of love. So, I root around in the, the discount bin at every game convention. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that too. Buy, but, buy one, get six free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, I, I, I buy all the discount stuff. I Today, I carried home. I went and I got my little, like, granny cart, you know, the oh, grocery cart right. used to walk with because somebody had thrown out a whole bunch of uh, plastic display cases from their store, and I couldn't stand to see good things go to waste. So I spent the day, like, carrying display cases home. I'll do everything for free, but then I'll turn around and spend, yeah. you know, $80 on Space Hulk. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, I got to uh, contact Michael from Dead Game Society and see if he uh, wants to check out some of this. But I got the Indiana Jones box set, the original one. Oh, Ooh, cool. Uh, without the cover, nice. though. Without the cover, which I'm kind of sad about. But it's the last half of the box, but it has the main book. It has the the Game Master book, and it has a whole bunch of printed information and the GM screen. All in the box. I, I love the uh, the urban legend around that game yeah. where it was said that TSR Hobbies, what was it, Trite? Or not TSR, but... West End Games? Uh, was it TSR or was it uh, Lucasfilm or somebody was trying to trademark the name Nazi? 
Oh yeah, yeah. That was, I think that was Lucas that did that. Yeah, he was trying to trademark it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, they trademarked other things like droids, so you know who well, knows. Yeah. So anyway, the point was I got it for like three bucks, and I couldn't believe. It. And there was actual character sheets in the back that someone filled out. So I got someone's old like predator character that they made up. <laughs> <laughs> someone In made Indiana up Indiana Jones. Yeah, it was. It said predator, and it had like all of like the traits of Why the not? predator. Why not? Yeah. Oh, cool! Crossing well, we genres should... like the last show. Yeah. <laughs> We should do something in, in, at some point soon about you know restoring some. We talked you know way way back about restoring books. Yeah. And I'm I'm discovering now because I've gone on a kick of picking up old box set of games, and I've realized that wow. I had to go look up how to repair these boxes and things. <laughs> um, you know, it's really cool. You bring all that stuff up, like you know that box set, and, yeah. And all and all and like how we're making our own uh, screens and the and. And Patrick, with his with his stuff that he does, it kind of all ties into that we're starting to see that there is a history behind this game now. There is a history all behind this stuff, mm-hmm. you know? And I think it's very important, me being a history guy, you know, got my degree in history and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, we have to preserve some of that, I think, for posterity and to understand where this all came from and i think in our own little ways we're doing that well see this is what i think was so cool about the hobby in the 70s is that you had all these people who were saying i want to play a game and there's no rules for this game so let's sit down and make some rules and while we're at it let's design some books and let's just make some things Mm -hmm. and they just did it yeah um and you know because it's the whole leftover the people who started the the adventure gaming hobby, you know, and the war gamers and stuff. A lot of these people were from that uh, '60s generation of, you know, Mother Jones, or sorry, a Mother, a Whole Earth Catalog, and that sort of do it yourself if you want it done right mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, you know, by doing this now with what we're doing, we're getting, like you said, a feel for that. We're going, hey, we got to make stuff too, and it's a lot easier for us because we've got these right. print-on-demand companies that can just do it for us. But, but I think it's interesting what, what Patrick that? does. It's almost like what you're doing there, Patrick, since you're still here with us. <laughs> it's almost like it's a historical preservation side to it as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. You're, you're finding mean, all these character sheets from like the Armory or the Games Workshop ones, and either you're scanning them and making them into PDFs for, and, you know, maybe, maybe making active fields, but they're still preserved in some fashion and it's still and in that small way it provides historical continuity to this to our hobby in the past right and you know i i just picked up a copy of osric you know a hardback book oh. uh just came in the mail the other day and that's nice. a it's a glorious thing it's something i wish i'd done myself um <laughs> but uh uh, you know, I, I still like my dream at this point is wow. What if I could actually make a replica of the player's handbook? Yes, and get that on Lulu, where you know anybody could come print themselves a new copy, you know, of the player's handbook from 1981 or you know whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, it's a good thing to do. I mean. There's there's no reason that – there's certainly some of these places that will be a little bit more careful about the copyright. But if you're talking about keeping it just I want to have a personal copy, somebody else wants to just have a personal copy or something like that, there's no reason as long as we find a way to kind of step away from the trademark that we shouldn't be able to do that. Oh, yeah. And totally that's, derailed that conversation, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just online wanted gaming. to – sorry, Patrick? And it's, oh, yeah, online gaming. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. To, to recap, I think pretty much um, the best option you have here is Open RPG. Uh, it has yeah. the servers up for you already. All you have to do is get around installing two pieces of uh, software, and that's it. Then you just click, you join a server, which a list will come up, and that's it. Boom, you can make your own room, password it, and then your players can do the same thing. You don't have to set up your computer to let incoming uh IP ports and stuff like that are, that people don't understand. Mm. Yeah, and so you know, for for comparing this to to playing in person, I think honestly, I think it's almost all. I, I I think it's always better to play in person when you can have your group there. But there's so many times that 
like you were saying, you move around a lot or your group gets dispersed or you just want to ha- get another game in yeah. maybe with people that, you know, friends that live far away now, any of those things. And even just playing the Skype games that we've had, we found that it's really the second best thing to playing in the same room. So maybe these tools can bring it even closer. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, if you have any comments on this about all the different online virtual gaming uh, tabletop applications out there uh, for our listeners, go ahead and uh, notify us on our RFI podcast uh, dot com. And then um, I guess we're going to go into the final segment. <laughs> Ooh, one of those electronic voting dealies. Well, I guess that's going to put a wrap on the show this week, guys. Then, it uh, was good. Yeah, and I had fun. <laughs> Patrick, thanks for staying with us throughout the whole oh, show. Yes, sure, thank and you. Th- and thanks for having me. Not a problem. We love having you on the show. Oh, before we get going, Jason, update on the Low Tech Con poll. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, I got the results here. Uh, we're keeping the poll up for a little bit. I'm going to try to see if I can move it to a permanent spot so that we can uh, have that. But right now, it looks like uh, the the in the lead mm-hmm. it, with about 30% of the votes is November 4th to the 6th of next year okay. that'd be 2011 okay um but it's 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 a close one you know there's there's not a ton of votes in yet so october 7th 9th is coming really close to that yeah i <laughs> Actually, voted october nice well that would be my birthday so i don't mind um i'm not going is in third place <laughs> <laughs> but don't know thanks okay. everyone <laughs> no but it's good it's good it's, it's only eight people i mean we don't have a huge number of people voting yet because we haven't really started pushing this right thing. um but I think, you know, and then with the others kind of trailing behind, I think what we're seeing emerge from this is that so far it looks like fall is a good time of year to do it. Yeah. And it makes sense, too. Does it? I think so, because I think the two, the real two dead areas for conventions is from the end of August up until, you know, after the Christmas holiday season okay well you know uh, october november i'm i'm a fan of those i think i kind of like the october date a little bit better because it'll it won't be as cool so we don't have i mean if we're talking november uh in some parts of the country you're getting into winter already and i hate to have anybody get snowed out and you also have people Hmm. planning for thanksgiving and christmas by then i yeah I usually I don't I, I vote for November honestly I, I October I I try to I'm busy <laughs> I go to King okay. I go to King Richard's Fair up in Massachusetts Oh so okay cool It's awesome a lot of people go there and I actually I've seen a lot of wrestlers there so you know. What what is it called King Richard's King Fair Yeah It's in uh, Boston what is it? It's a it's a it's a Renaissance fair pretty much Oh okay okay well the reason I had the November date in there is because that is the date of the New England Web Comics weekend and um, oh, I'm right. thinking it would be maybe good for our first time around to try to team up with them, uh, you know, so that we could have a, a larger thing to offer to people. Yeah, so but, that's okay. a good idea. Yeah, so we can team up with a bigger con and get our name out there. And uh, Yeah, and they're not a gaming con. They're a web comics convention. So it would be a good fit because uh, there wouldn't be any um, – there wouldn't be any competition for events and things like that, but there is a huge amount of crossover in terms of the people. Oh, yeah. Go. yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. go to our site, rfipodcast.com. Please, please vote so Jason knows what to do next year instead of just <laughs> yeah. randomly picking a date. If you're like date. Jason, vote often. Yeah, so if yeah. You vote often. Um, <laughs> oh, and, two, three and times. I'll, ha- I'll also ask people, if anybody's interested in you know, uh, running games or bringing old computer and video games from the 70s and early 80s uh, or anything else, I'll try to come up with some things that people can volunteer for. Yeah. And uh, we'll get that up because obviously without volunteers to come and actually run the games at the con, there's no con. <laughs> it's very right? true. Makes uh, sense. Uh, yeah. If you're interested in volunteering or you just want to run a game or you just want to go, Email Jason at Jason at RFIPodcast.com or RFI staff at gmail.com. Visit the site at lowtech.com. Is that right, Jason? Lowtech.com? Lowtechcon. Oh, lowtechcon.com. All one word, lowtechcon. Yep. .com. 
Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I was trying not to screw that up. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, go there, and you can put in your email address. It'll notify you when Jason updates it with information. Uh, and thank you for joining us this week. Uh, Patrick, how can people get a hold of you in case they are too lazy to go to the website? <laughs> Oh, too too lazy to go to my website or yes, yours? Your, your website. Too lazy, too lazy Either one. Ours. How do they find <laughs> okay. yours? Well, again, my site is mad-irishman.net or .com. Actually, we'll get you there. Or you can email me, madirishman, all one word, at mad-irishman.net. Uh, That's awesome. pretty easy. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us this week. And next week, we should have uh, Jonathan from Epic Words on. Sweet. Awesome. Yes. Okay, so yeah. keep and, it in uh, Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's it? No, actually, that's it. Okay. He'll be here. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So keep it original, keep it old school, and keep your clerics with blunt weapons. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> good night. Good night. Keep your cleric short, sharp. sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. for initiative.